This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I thought it might be useful to answer preemptively a question I often get asked, which is, when you were out at the CIA, did you get to participate in any actual covert operations? <laughs> and the answer, I haven't disclosed much about this before, but this seems like a small and discreet group. And I, <laughs> the answer is, yeah, on one occasion I did, and, and I think I can give you the bare essentials. Uh, my wife and I were classmates at Stanford, and so when I'd been at the CIA about eight months, 24-7 job, um, we decided we were going to take three days off, go to our Stanford reunion, cash in some old frequent flyer miles, go out first class, see old friends, go to the homecoming game. Well, the first thing that happened is my director of security at the CIA said, Mr. Uh, Director, I'm afraid Mrs. Woolsey's going to have to go on a different flight because we can't have anybody uh, named Woolsey on the flight. I said, wait a minute, my name's Woolsey. He said, oh, no, sir, you need to fly an alias. And, of course, my first thought was, uh-oh, there go the frequent flyer miles. <laughs> so uh, my wife goes out to the airport, gets on a flight to San Francisco, first class, uh, sits back with her glass of wine and has a great uh, trip. Uh, I get on another flight with my two security guys. In those simpler times, they just stop by the cockpit, show the pilot and the chief flight attendant that they're carrying weapons that they're authorized to by the federal government. And uh, then we go back to the back row of coach right in front of the bulkhead where you can't even lean back. I'm wedged in between these two big guys for this, this six and a half hour flight to California. We're walking down the jetway in San Francisco. No flight attendant comes over and whispers something to my security man. His, 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 his nickname was Rock, and he was a big guy, and a stolid guy, and he just cracked up. And I couldn't figure out, I'd never seen him guffaw like that. I said, Rock, what's so funny? He said, you know what she said? She said, you know, I've been on these flights for 20 years, and that is the politest and best behaved prisoner that we've ever had. <laughs> So there are two good things about that. One is I successfully pulled off, off a covert op, getting to Stanford. And the uh, other is that it was actually about the nicest thing anybody said about me in the two years that I was in the job. You don't tend to get many compliments as head of the, the CIA. Well, um, I thought I would share with you uh, some thoughts about how we ought to consider deciding about what to do about energy and where, as a nation, uh, uh, it would be a good idea for us to go. And I'm going to approach this a little differently than is standard. The standard way of approaching energy issues, particularly in the academic world these days, and in much of the Washington policy world, is to take one criterion, CO2 emissions, and uh, one at a time, analyze solutions, cellulosic ethanol for cars, for example, find that that solution will not solve the entire problem, reject it, and then go on to do the same thing with something else. Um, it's basically a recipe for continuing despondency. Uh, I want to suggest two differences. One is that we should not think in terms of solely analysis, but also of synthesis and try to come up with a portfolio of approaches to dealing with energy. And the portfolio needs to be big enough to do the job, but not to include everything. So what one often gets sometimes from energy companies' advertisements is that the answer is all of the above. Uh, no, sorry, can't afford all of the above. Need to focus some, but also not to assume that one uh, solution is the right one. You might, uh, for example, have been in, put all your money in Bear Stearns, in which case you would probably not be happy. Not a single solution in synthesis. The other is the criteria. Uh, 
Uh, I uh, think climate change is an important issue. Be glad to talk about it some in the Q's and A's if, if people want. Uh, but it's not the only issue we face. There really are three sets of issues. One is environmental, including both climate change and local uh, pollution, such as SOx and NOx and particulates and knocking the tops off mountains in Appalachia. Uh, one set has to do with security. Can we make sure we're going to be getting uh, the oil we need as long as we're depending in part on uh, OPEC and uh, the Middle East? Uh, what about terrorist attacks uh, on various parts of our energy infrastructure? And the third has to do with the affordability and availability to the world of energy solutions. And by the world, I'm including what's sometimes called the bottom two billion, the billion and a half to two billion people in the world who effectively have no energy except maybe a, you know, a tiny bit of electricity from a generator somewhere in their African village for a few minutes a day. So it is important that energy be actually available to people, not just theoretically available to them. Those three sets of criteria have to be looked at in terms of the threats to our being denied energy. And the way I characterize these in my mind is the environmental problems, the environmental threats, I characterize as concerns of uh, one of the three friends I'm going to introduce you to today, uh, the ghost of John Muir. John Muir, as I'm sure most everybody in this part of the world knows, uh, was the father of the modern environmental movement. He was the uh, uh, Frank, he was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's great friend and the father of the, the, not only the Sierra Club, but of the uh, uh, whole national park system, et cetera. And Muir, were he alive today, would be concerned, I think, both about climate change and about individual types of pollution, such as SOx and NOx and particulates and, and the rest. The second uh, ghost who I... Uh, have my little conversations with, in a sense, is an individual who is deeply concerned about the security of the United States and of democracies in general and totally committed to protecting them, and that ghost is the ghost of George Patton. Patton is worried in my little dialogue or trilogue that I'm going to suggest here, uh, not only about oil cutoffs, but about using energy infrastructure, such as the electric grid and its cyber vulnerabilities, as an instrumentality or a way of attack, attacking the United States or other friendly countries, and something that we have to concern ourselves with. And my third ghost is that of Mahatma Gandhi, who best symbolizes, uh, I think, the concern for the bottom two billion in the world, and for real availability of solutions as distinct from theories. If you look at a map, a satellite map of sub-Saharan Africa taken 30 years ago at night, except for a few spots in Nigeria and a few spots in South Africa, it's almost completely dark because there's essentially no electricity. If you look at that same map, satellite map at night of sub-Saharan Africa, taken, a picture taken, say, yesterday, it will look almost exactly like the picture taken 30 years ago. Dark, no electricity. Because although there have been a few projects, big dams and so forth, that have actually come into existence, generally speaking, the grand plans of the World Bank or others to come up with huge energy projects for sub-Saharan Africa never seem to work out. They never seem to actually get built for one reason or another. Gandhi is concerned about that. Gandhi likes local control. In his salt march and his other marches uh, for, uh, to bring, try to bring independence to India, he always carried it with him a chakra, which is an Indian spinning wheel, and that chakra is in the middle of the Indian flag. What it symbolizes, among other things, is local self-sufficiency. Gandhi would spin cotton two hours a day when he was on his marches. What he was saying to the world was that you should not, if you can avoid it, just pick cotton and ship it off to England or someplace to be processed. If 
You have been spinning cotton for thousands of years in Indian villages, perfect it, modernize it, continue to do it, become important in the economic chain, take responsibility in part for your own control over your own economic life. So Muir, Patton, and Gandhi all, to me at least, kind of symbolize different but equally important concerns about energy. And if you are only dealing with one of them, or only part of what one of them is worried about, say CO2, I don't think you are approaching a reasonable resolution of the problem in a comprehensive way. So what I'm going to do is say a few words about each of our two major energy systems, electricity and transportation, and look at each one briefly through the eyes of each of my three ghosts, and then uh, see where that may lead us and throw it open to any questions that you might have. We have uh, several smaller energy systems used for oil, for home heating, et cetera, in the country, but generally speaking, our two biggest ones and the two biggest in the world are electricity generation and transportation. Electricity generation in the United States is fueled 51% by coal and the rest by a mixture of uh, nuclear, gas, hydro, and a little bit of renewables. Uh, transportation is fueled 96% by oil products of one kind or another, and three quarters of that oil, conventional oil, is controlled by OPEC. One way you know that someone doesn't know a damn thing about energy is if he says to you, our big problem is oil imports, because we import close to two-thirds of our oil. Here's how we're going to solve it. We're going to build nuclear power plants or wind farms or whatever. It may be a good idea to build nuclear power plants or wind farms or whatever in order to produce electricity, but today it has essentially nothing to do with oil demand. You could build nuclear power plants and wind farms forever, and if you still stayed 96% oil fueling your transportation and virtually no oil being used to produce electricity, you're not going to do anything about oil by building nuclear power plants and wind farms. We'll get back in a minute to that because that might change in the future. But today, it's not like the 1970s when 20% of our electricity came from oil. It doesn't anymore, so you can't solve our oil import problem by building power plants. Now, um, let's look first at electricity. What types of programs should we focus on for the future, and what would each of our three ghosts say about them? Well, let's look at Muir first. Muir has two concerns. One is local pollution, socks, knocks, particulates, knocking mountaintops off in Appalachia. That's almost entirely a coal problem, almost entirely. The other ways of producing electric power that we actually use today don't create environmental problems like that. Coal does, big time. What about climate change? Well, uh, nuclear and hydro don't, in their operation, essentially contribute anything to climate change, CO2 emissions. Uh, natural gas is about a third of coal's uh, contribution per kilowatt, for installed kilowatt, uh, or per generated kilowatt hour, let's say, uh, in CO2 emissions because natural gas has about half as much CO2 in it uh, as coal, and, but natural gas plants are considerably more efficient than coal plants. So when you're using natural gas, you're putting out about a third of the CO2 that you are if you're using coal to generate electricity. Uh, so. CO2 is a bit, a small bit, natural gas problem, and in the electricity field, hugely a coal problem. From Muir's point of view, coal, big time, is the issue. Can we deal with coal? By capturing and sequestering the carbon. 
producing clean coal someday. Yes, maybe. My judgment, likely to be awfully expensive, in part because the infrastructure of pipelines for CO2 you would need in order to capture the CO2 from the coal-fired power plants, move it all over the country in order to put it down into the deep saline aquifers where it probably would have to go, would be an infrastructure approximately as, as, approximately as large as the existing infrastructure of oil and gas pipelines. So not a small step, possibly doable, but I tend not to turn that way if one is looking toward how to generate electricity. Okay, it is often said, you care about CO2, go nuclear. We haven't built a nuclear power plant for 30 years because of some stupid reason, people say, and let's get the government into the business of funding nuclear power plants and build them. It's clean and cheap to operate. Let's go. Couple of problems. First of all, nuclear power plants per installed watt cost between four and five times what natural gas plants do. They're very cheap to operate, but extremely expensive to build, which is why the market hasn't built any in 30 years, and they will only be built with very substantial federal subsidies. Well, still, CO2 is an important issue. We may well need to go that way in spite of the expense of construction and the need for that kind of a subsidy. What, if anything else, is wrong with nuclear power? I would suggest this. Back in the early 90s, we had underway work going on, some of it at Livermore, at the national laboratories, on different types of nuclear cycles. Uh, fast converter reactors that essentially eat their own uh, waste. Uh, thorium cycle that's a lot less likely to be able to be diverted into nuclear weapons than the, what we have today. You can get disagreements among experts about whether or not uh, those would be adequate in staying, keeping us away from having a nuclear reactor be a source of fissile material for nuclear weapons. But there's very little plausible disagreement with the following proposition. Assuming we are going to have to stay with light water reactors of the current type for a substantial period of time while new technologies may be invented, building added nuclear reactors in the U.S. and getting back into the nuclear business is almost certainly going to push the companies that get into that to keep their costs down by selling such reactors as widely as possible. Now, if there weren't a proliferation problem, we might say it doesn't matter that when we sell nuclear reactors abroad, we won't always be selling to, say, Switzerland, and we may be selling to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt, et cetera. But the problem is that with the current type of light water reactors and the current international treaty regime, the Nonproliferation Treaty, every light water reactor is a potential source of the fissile material one needs for the nuclear weapons, because the current treaty regime does not keep you out of enriching uranium or reprocessing plutonium. And when you enrich uranium up to the 5% level that you need for a producing electricity, you are about two thirds, maybe nearly three quarters of the way in terms of the work that needs to be done toward enriching it up to the level of 90% or so that you need for a nuclear weapon. North Korea has shown this, Iran has shown this, if you are selling light water reactors to anybody who wants to buy them, including, say, countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which are very much on the list, you are a Johnny Appleseed of nuclear weapons. You are moving around the earth, planting future nuclear weapons, because the weapon itself is pretty easy to design. The problem is getting the fissile material. And the fissile material, especially highly enriched uranium, can come just from the enrichment process. So we got a big problem with nukes. In a different world, a different international treaty regime, a world, as Tennyson, I think, put it, uh, where there's a parliament of man, 
where everybody's a democracy, where there's full transparency, where countries don't cheat, in that imaginary world, this might be fine. But short of that, we got a real problem with nukes. Well, what else can you use for baseload? Clearly, Woolsey, people are saying, yeah, you're an enthusiast for solar and wind and this renewable stuff, but you know, the sun only shines in the daytime, and on days like this, not necessarily in the daytime. The wind generally blows at night. It's going to take a long time to get enough renewables in. What are you going to use for your base load of electricity so we don't have to give up hot showers and cold beer while we're headed toward this lovely renewable future out there somewhere in the future? I would suggest the most likely base load uh, for the foreseeable future now is natural gas. Gas does produce some CO2, but so much less than coal. It's not, I think, near, nearly as much a problem as coal, and it essentially produces none of the other types of pollution, except that the new gas shale formations that, have, that are, are being discovered and have radically increased people's estimates of how much natural gas is available in this country and around the world have to be exploited by a process called hydrofracturing or fracking which, if you look, for example, the front page story in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, may create problems with the water that's been put under pressure and pumped into the well, fracturing it, enabling the extraction of natural gas, the water coming back up out of the well, having a lot of pollutants attached to it, needs to be cleaned or disposed of. It's an issue. It's something we've got to deal with. We can't just go polluting every place that is on, sitting on top of a gas field. But, at least in my judgment, there is likely to be more than one technological solution to this, but we need to get on it and work on it. If we solve the pollution water problem from hydrofracturing, natural gas has some rather remarkable uh, opportunities as a baseload. The reason we haven't gone to it more than we have in the past is not the cost of new plants, they're low. By the way, if you're driving along a freeway and you see a flatbed truck passing you and it has what looks like an aircraft engine on it, it may be an aircraft engine or it may be a natural gas plant. Smallest ones are effectively aircraft engines. So natural gas also, by the way, lends itself to cogeneration, capturing the waste heat from the generation of electricity and using it Second, a second time, say to heat a building or otherwise. The Danes, by the way, get about a third of their electricity from cogeneration of that sort. We get about five or six percent of ours from it in the United States just because public utility commissions haven't wanted to get into it. They'd really have people build power plants, I suppose. But natural gas has some real advantages with cogeneration. And it is, at least in apparently, from the sites where one can get the shale and how broadly dispersed they are, it creates a possibility of getting gas from a wide range of, of places. Good news potentially for Europe. Natural gas production in Europe would uh, free the Europeans from the whims of Mr. Putin, who whenever he gets mad at somebody seems to, seems to turn off their natural gas. Happily, we don't have the same problem with Canada. We get about a third of our, we get about 15% of our natural gas from, from Canada. But uh, since uh, uh, they whipped us twice when we were tried to conquer them in the late 1770s and, the, and 1812, uh, and we've given up on whipping them, uh, the Canadians continue to be rather nice to us. We get along with them reasonably well. We don't have the same problem the Europeans do with Russia. The other thing about natural gas is it's easily turned on and off. And so it's a good way to do what's called firm renewables. There are two things you need to do with renewables if you're going to move heavily toward them. One is develop excellent and better and better electricity storage, probably in batteries, but maybe in other devices as well, because electricity's big problem is that it's a just-in-time system. You have to produce it just as you're using it with very minor changes. And if you can move away from that, 
produce electricity in the daytime from solar, store it enough that you can use it in the early evening, and made it up with natural gas that's relatively easily turned on and off, you may be able to have a partnership, essentially, between storage improvements, natural gas, larger availability, far more affordably than it was looking to be the case before the shale discoveries, uh, and renewables. Interesting set of possibilities. What about renewables? Several have potential promise. Geothermal in the western part of the United States, uh, small-scale uh, uh, hydro in streams and, and rivers uh, where you don't have to build a dam. You can just have a propeller, a turbine essentially under the water. There are several possibilities, but the two biggest are probably solar and wind. And uh, today, some large-scale solar and wind plants are obtaining cost levels that are looking more and more attractive. Thermal solar in the Mojave Desert, uh, wind farms in Texas and central part of the United States. The problem is that once you generate the electricity from the sun in the Mojave or from the wind in Kansas, you got to get it to where people are. And today, in a lot of circumstances, you will take a year or so building a thermal solar plant in the Mojave or building a wind farm in Texas or Kansas, and then you'll litigate or have permit proceedings for seven, eight, nine, ten years, uh, and you will eventually end up, if you can ever get hooked up to a transmission line, you will eventually buy, in order to avoid the Indian burial grounds and the snail darters and so forth, your transmission line will sort of look like that. And maybe it'll get in in a few years and maybe it won't. Uh, transmission, long distance transmission, therefore, uh, creates some, some serious blockage to actually having the power in hand. Quick word about what Patton thinks about electricity. He's got two main concerns. Attacks on the electricity grid, particularly on the transformers by terrorist groups, and hacking into the SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition systems uh, that control the grid. The transformers especially are extremely vulnerable and extremely important to the system. The big transformers that hike up the voltage so electricity can be tr transmitted long distances and then step it down again. They aren't made in the United States anymore, the two biggest ones. They're made in, in South Korea and Northern Europe. You've got to stand in line for quite a while to get one. They tend to be tailored to individual uses, so at this point at least yet, you don't have modular ones. They're very big and very difficult to move. And the utilities have this interesting habit of, if they should have a spare transformer, storing it outside in the electric substation behind the cyclone fence, often just a few feet from the highway, storing it right next to the operating transformer. That puts a heavy burden on a terrorist. He has a 30-06, let's say, with, uh, with armor-piercing rounds in it. He has to pull off the road and fire two shots instead of one in order to take out not only the operating transformer, but its spare. The U.S. electric grid is not the only part of our infrastructure that's vulnerable. We have 13 major critical infrastructures, including water provision, sewage pumping, et cetera. All 12 of the others depend on electricity. So if the electricity goes down, all the others do too. And if the electricity is down accidentally, tree branch touching a power line has occurred in, in Cleveland back in I think uh, 03, taking out 50 million consumers from electric power for several days in the northeastern U.S. and eastern Canada, 
Then if it's over in a few days and you've got a home generator and some diesel and the hospitals certainly do and so forth, you'll probably get through it all right. But by the way, when that happened and, and Cleveland's uh, power line touched by a tree branch uh, took out northeastern U.S. and eastern Canada, several days, 50 million consumers, billions of dollars. We tried to take a leaf uh, from the book of the uh, South Park kids and blame Canada. <laughs> the Canadians, however, in their polite way, pointed out to us that actually Cleveland is south of Lake Erie, not north. <laughs> and we had to admit it was our tree branch and our power line. And the real problem, as Patton would point out to you, is that terrorists are a lot smarter than tree branches. They do not have to just go after a power line. They can go after the transformer. So that's one of Patton's concerns. The other is that whereas the control systems for the electric grid used to operate largely locally, and most of us generated our electricity locally, and if we got into a real bind, we'd buy a bit of electricity from a neighboring grid. Having gone to deregulation in the late 1990s, we're now trying to move and buy electricity from all over the grid, and those who are responsible for doing it care a great deal about a tiny fraction of a penny in cost. So we've got a national grid really stressed with trying to keep up with what we're doing with electricity. And uh, in order to make that work, we have gone to more and more off-the-shelf software for a lot of computers and off-the-shelf firewalls. Let me tell you how effective those firewalls are. They do a great job of keeping hackers out as long as the hackers are only in elementary school. But once you get into junior high school and you're pretty good at some of those video games, you're through those SCADA uh, firewalls about as fast as a hot knife through butter. So we have an electric grid on which everything depends, because without electricity, you're not back in the 1970s pre-web, you're back in the 1870s pre-electricity. And you probably don't have, can't, aren't going to be able to find that manual pump handle for the well in your backyard so you get drinking water. You probably forgot to have that plow horse in the back of your house to help you plow a field to plant food crops. We're back in the 1870s without anything that made it possible for people even to survive in the 1870s. If the grid goes down for a substantial period of time as a result of a terrorist attack or hacking attacks. So Patton, to put it mildly, has some major problems with our current electricity structure. He notes that if the grid were just distributed, if you had local generation in a lot of places of electricity, and you could island if other parts of the grid went down, you would not have the electricity available you'd need to, say, run a local aluminum plant. You need bulk power from the transmission grid for that. But if you had some local solar and wind and, and natural gas, you might at least be able for the community to be able to have about half the electricity that it normally has. And to keep things functioning at a bare bones level. It might not be pleasant, but it wouldn't be a total catastrophe as would be the complete loss of electricity. So uh, Patton, for his own security reasons, has some real interest in distributed uh, uh, generation of electricity. Gandhi remembers those maps of sub-Saharan Africa and doesn't really believe that the big power plants are ever going to show up. Now, India gets about half of its electricity from, uh, from coal and from big power plants, but there are huge numbers of outages. It's a serious problem, and in some parts of the world less developed than India, it's a gigantic problem. If you could generate electricity locally at the village level, Gandhi begins to think of power and energy and electricity somewhat the way he was thinking of weaving cloth with his chakra.
So all three of my ghosts have big worries about electricity. And for all three of them, moving toward distributed generation of renewables and natural gas with appropriate moves toward making things more secure and making things more available at a local level begins to appeal to them. Muir hopes that, since he really wants to get away from CO2, he hopes that if you've got some power plants and wind farms in Kansas or solar power plants in the Mojave that are already on transmission lines and you can get going, that we would. But as a general proposition, he's very interested, all three of them, in distributed generation of renewables and gas. They tend to be able to agree on that. If they turn to transportation, they could all also agree, I would think, that Andy Frank and some of his colleagues have started something pretty interesting some years ago, namely the electrification of transportation. Are we going to be able to move really quickly toward all electric vehicles? Well, if you've got a spare 100,000 and you want to put it in a sports car like Tesla, great. They're wonderful little things. But short of that, and short of full electrification, plug-in hybrids have some real possibilities. Because first of all, you may be able to produce enough electricity locally to drive 20, 30, 40 miles a day. And since the average car in the US goes 25 miles and three quarters cars go less than 40 miles a day, if you are electrified in part, as in a plug-in hybrid, you are an all-electric vehicle, say, with a 40-mile Chevy Volt, you're an all-electric vehicle three days out of four. Now, with a plug-in hybrid, when you get to the end of that 25 or 30 or 40 miles, do you have to find a plug? No, only if you want to drive at roughly two cents a mile instead of six, eight, ten cents a mile. If you're willing to keep going at six, eight, ten cents a mile, then you can go with liquid fuel that's in the tank, either with an alternate drivetrain, as with a Prius that's been converted, or with the little one liter engine with its liquid fuel supply that just charges the battery on a Chevy Volt and keeps you going. So you have a range of two, three hundred miles. It's just that on an, most days, you don't get into the need for using liquid fuel. And if Pat and Muir and Gandhi got your electricity reoriented in terms of distributed generation, that 20, 30, 40 miles for an average day might well come from your roof. I drive a plug-in hybrid today. I drive the first 20 and have electric photovoltaic cells on the roof of my farmhouse, batteries in the basement. So if I want to show off and go off grid for the day, I can't have as much electricity as I otherwise would, but I can quite literally drive about my first 25 miles on sunlight. These are not theories. These are programs and products that are coming into the market if we get them organized well. What other things might you want to do to deal with your oil dependence problem? Patton, oh, by the way, in terms of cleanliness, Muir doesn't have a big problem with this. Because even though you're driving on electricity, Natural Resources Defense Council, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, and EPRI have all done studies and said in the, the nation as a whole, on average, going from a vehicle that's all gasoline to one that's a plug-in hybrid, say 25, 30 mile plug-in hybrid, reduces your global warming gas emissions by something in the range of 10 to 15 percent. And that's nation average as a whole. In a clean grid state like California, which uses very little coal of some from across borders, but is, California's grid is quite clean. Uh, in a clean grid state like California, you improve your global warming gas emissions by going to a plug-in hybrid by about 80 to 90 percent. So as the grid cleans up, Muir is very happy that the cars will be cleaned up at the same time. Patton has a lot of worries about oil dependence. So he would be glad to see electrification of transportation or anything that gets us off oil. 
because he notes that eight out of nine of the largest oil exporting countries in the world are dictatorships or autocratic kingdoms, only nice Norway is kind of out of in strange company there. Canada's 10th, by the way, so eight of the top 10 or eight of the top nine uh, are dictatorships or autocratic kingdoms. It is um, also very much on Patton's mind that 20, the 22 countries in the world that depend on oil for two-thirds or more of their national income are all dictatorships and autocratic kingdoms, every one. Patton is also very attentive to the fact that, um, as Bernard Lewis puts it, there should be no taxation without representation, but it's also true that there's no representation without taxation. In other words, if you're so rich from imported oil that you don't need taxes, you tend not to have a real legislature, and the big oil exporters don't. Now, a country like Canada or Norway that's already a functioning democracy and has a diverse economy and gets a large amount of oil doesn't become a dictatorship, but something that's already a dictatorship or autocratic kingdom tends to have that tendency enhanced by being dependent on a commodity that has a huge amount of economic rent associated with it. Professor Paul Collier of Oxford is probably the leading individual in establishing this theory of what's sometimes called the oil curse and is summed up very well by Tom Friedman in his book Hot, Flat, and Crowded in a chapter called Filler Up with Dictators. So Patton sees most of the trouble coming at the United States and the democracies in the world in the future coming from states that we are paying for their oil. He also notes that we borrow at $70 a barrel oil, we borrow about a billion dollars a day to finance our oil imports, just the imports, which are approaching two thirds of our oil. And Patton is also more than slightly worried about Saudi Arabia. He points out that Lawrence Wright, the author of The Looming Tower, I think is the best book, by the way, on Al-Qaeda and 9-11, Wright says in there that with between 1 and 2 percent of the world's Muslims, the Saudis control approximately 90 percent of the world's Islamic institutions. That's paid for by the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars a year the world ships to OPEC and Saudis in particular. And so, we find that this war on terrorism that we're in, or call it contingency operations abroad if you want to be more politically correct, uh, is the only war, I guess, since the Civil War the United States has ever fought in where we pay for both sides. <laughs> Not a real sound strategy, Patton says. He uh, even says to those who will listen to him this. If you want to know, given those facts, if you want to know who is paying for these little eight, nine, ten-year-old boys in madrasas in Pakistan or the West Bank to be taught that their highest aspiration in life should be to become a suicide bomber, if you want to know who's paying for that, next time you pull into a filling station, Patton says, before you get out to charge your gas, Turn the rearview mirror just a couple of inches so you're looking into your own eyes. Now you know who's paying for those little Palestinian and Pakistani boys to be taught to be suicide bombers. So Patton has big time problems with oil. Electrification, that appeals to him as a substitute. Advanced biofuels appeal to him. He understands, along with Muir and Gandhi, that it's going to be a lot easier to use advanced biofuels if they're drop-in fuels, that is, if they're diesel coming from, let's say, algae, or if they are um, biobutanol coming from waste products, if they're a fuel that can be integrated into existing fuel supply systems and pipelines and so forth without difficulty and complexity. Uh, 
and without building added facilities. He also is excited about the prospect of improvements largely using electronics and internal combustion engines that will require the fuel to be used less. And he even is perfectly happy to think of natural gas being used for fleet vehicles like school buses and for interstate trucking. He, he and Gandhi and Muir are all a bit worried about trying to have natural gas fuel the family car because then you need gas, gas, natural gas pumps at all the filling stations and that's a big investment in infrastructure. But for trucks, maybe fine. So Patton and Muir can get along fine on an approach toward transportation which uses the distributed generation of electricity for electrification in part of transportation, which uses advanced biofuels, which uses improvements in mileage from improved internal combustion engines, and which uses to some extent natural gas. And he points out that if you come at oil from all of those directions simultaneously, you may be able to move an awful lot faster than if you're trying to move with only one of those solutions alone. Gandhi has listened to all this so far. He loves the distributed generation for the reasons I described. And transportation, he has no problem at all with having transportation proceed from electrified vehicles that have the power generated locally. Uh, and uh, my three ghosts, again, after thinking it through, have a generally common approach toward transportation and a generally common approach toward generation of electricity. Is each of the three totally satisfied with everything? No. Muir would have preferred a bigger emphasis on everything being renewable as soon as possible. But real progress toward renewables seems possible and the compromise with natural gas is one that he can live with. The main thing Patton says that he wants to stress is that whereas coal is an environmental and CO2 problem, oil is a CO2 and environmental and security problem. In addition to fixing the vulnerabilities of the electricity grid, we have to, Patton says, do something radical about oil. This analogy which was first picked up by my friend Annie Corrin in her writings is that we need, he says, to turn oil into salt. And what he means by that is up until the beginning of the 20th century, salt was a strategic commodity. It was the only way to preserve meat. It was hugely important to the human food chain. Those who produced salt had a total monopoly on preserving meat, and so salt was a very big deal. Countries went to war over salt mines as recently as the 1880s. With the coming of the electric grids at the end of the 1890s and into the early 20th century, refrigeration and freezing became widely available, and people realized that frozen and thawed meat tasted an awful lot better than meat that had been soaked in salt brine, and it was, by the way, cheaper given the salt monopoly prices. It was cheaper to freeze meat than it was to soak it in salt brine. So within a very few years, salt was destroyed as a strategic commodity. It wasn't destroyed, period. You will see some on your table at dinner this evening. But I doubt if you will look at it and say, you know, I wonder if we're salt independent. <laughs> I wonder where that comes from. Do we import as much as two-thirds of our salt? You don't care. Because unless you're long in Morton's, salt is boring. We need, Patton says, to do that to oil. The ultimate objective is as soon as possible, make oil boring. Thank you.
Jim, thank you very much for those uh, fascinating remarks. And uh, uh, if you'd permit me, I'd like to begin with the first question. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, a number of our uh, students and alumni here today from the Graduate School of Management. And so in addition to being fascinated with your comments about technology and security and uh, policy issues, uh, they might also be very interested in your fascinating career and its, its evolution. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, some uh, key point uh, and experience that, that you had in your career that led you on to this path, in particular in, in security-related issues and government policy. You sure you want me to do this? OK. <laughs> All right. Um, I was born to two Scoop Jackson Democrats, and I'm a Scoop Jackson Democrat. These days, you'd probably call me a Joe Lieberman Democrat or near Democrat. And so I've always been kind of conservative on foreign policy issues and kind of liberal on domestic stuff. In law school in 67, 68, my last year in law school, I got sufficiently fed up with Westmoreland's search and destroy operations in Vietnam that I founded Yale Citizens for Eugene McCarthy for president. I was effectively the head of the anti-war movement at Yale in 67, 68. And let me tell you, it takes a lot to get me into an anti-war movement. But Westmoreland managed. And so I spent a chunk of my time, my last year in law school, getting lots of people to get clean for Gene and shave their beards and go up to New Hampshire and go door to door and all the stuff we did. They got 42% of the vote in the 68 presidential primary for McCarthy and caused Johnson to withdraw from the race for the presidency and to, to replace Westmoreland with Abrams and, and so forth. Um, I went on active duty in the summer of 68, right at the end of this, because I had an ROTC commission and my own personal views on the war uh, in political terms, uh, I thought should not affect my obligation to serve in the military, which I had, so I went on active duty. I had written a <clears throat> piece for Yale on cost effectiveness analysis and program budgeting for urban police departments for the Law Journal. It was noticed by a man named Alan Intoven, who was running a a panel, a group, a small staff for the Secretary of Defense doing cost effectiveness analysis of all kinds of military matters. So he offered me a job in the Pentagon. And I was sitting in a vault, actually, uh, doing cost effectiveness analysis of how to design reconnaissance satellites. When a few months later, in January of 69, my wife and I got invited to uh, an engagement party. It was the engagement party of an old friend of ours from Stanford who was marrying the daughter of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Nitza. Nitza, wonderful man, had served presidents going back FDR all the way a long time. And Nitza, very much a member of the Washington establishment, the engagement party was two or three hundred people, black tie, F Street Club, six courses. The Dean Atchison's, the da 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 da. It was, it was ta ta. With a few of us who were much younger and were going to be in the wedding party. Somehow, standing in the middle of the F Street Club at this black tie reception before this big dinner, Lieutenant Woolsey and Deputy Secretary of Defense Nitsa get into a loud and angry argument about the Vietnam War. <laughs> Nitsa, we each had champagne flutes, which had been emptied. Nitsa starts poking at me with his champagne flute. I poke back but retreat, sort of like a young upstart having challenged D'Artagnan. I'm pinned against the windows, fending him off. His wife comes and hauls him in. Everybody goes in for dinner. Driving home that evening, I said to my wife, well, Nitsa and I got in a little discussion about the war. And she said, yeah, everybody noticed. <laughs> I said, but, you know, it doesn't matter. He's only going to be around another couple of weeks, and then the Republicans come in. So I uh, forget about it. Well, that's true. Nothing happened. And then about three months later, along about March or April, Nitsa comes back, because everybody wants Nitsa to work for him. And Laird, the new Secretary of Defense, needs somebody to go over and negotiate with the Soviets in Helsinki and Vienna about strategic nuclear weapons. It's this new idea, arms control negotiations. And so my boss gives me a call. And he says, Jim, uh, Nitsa's back. I said, yeah, I heard. And he said, you know, he's going to go over and negotiate with the Soviets in Helsinki and Vienna about our, all our strategic forces. 
and he needs an assistant. He needs somebody to draft the statements and to keep track of stuff, and you know, you, you're a lawyer, it might be a treaty, it might be some legal work involved, and you've been working on intelligence, that may be relevant, would you be interested? And I said, well, you know, I can't think of anything I'd rather do as a lieutenant in the Army than go over to Helsinki and Vienna and negotiate with the Soviets about strategic weapons, sounds pretty interesting, but I said, I, I've only met Nitsa once, and it, it didn't go real well. <laughs> and Charles, kind of grinned and said, well, that must be what he meant. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I mentioned your name to him, and he paused for a minute. <laughs> and then after a minute, he kind of grinned, and he said, yeah, he said, that's fine. He said, send Woolsey on up. He may not know what the hell he's talking about, but at least he'll speak up. <laughs> so, I rarely give career guidance to people on how to get into a government career. What worked for me was being a brash kid and getting into an argument at a black tie dinner he was hosting for his daughter's engagement with the Deputy Secretary of Defense as a lieutenant in the Army, and the marvelous man hired me really because I'd gotten in the argument with him. Because that's what Paul Nitzel was like. What it says about me is I was a brash kid. What it says about him, and he was a remarkable man, I guess I'd say the most important thing is see if you can find somebody like Nitsa, somebody who wants you to argue with him, to present alternate views, not to say, yes, sir, whatever you say, sir. If the person only wants you to say, yes, sir, whatever you say, sir, it probably will be a pretty boring job, and it may not be a very useful one. But if you find somebody like that, and I was just lucky, if you find somebody like Paul Nitze, almost no matter what he or she is working on, go work with them. That's what I'd say.